Good morning, everybody. I'll give you just one more second to get situated here as people are coming in. All right, well, welcome. This is a NRI session. I've always found these to be really informative to hear what the other uh, regions and, and nationals are up to. So thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, we're going to focus this one specifically on uh, privacy best practices and, and hearing how other nations are, are managing the privacy issue. Uh, so uh, this is will be interesting dialogue, and I, I hope to learn. You know, if other people are doing a better job than some of the challenges that we're having, um, especially in the DNS space as we're, we're working through that. Um, so uh, welcome. I'm just going to go ahead and um, introduce my co-moderator here. Oh, I'm Shane Tews. I am with the Internet Governance Forum from the uh, United States. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Luis Fernando Castro from Brazil. I'm a member of the CGI.br, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, Shane. And uh, it's, we, we had a previous discussion in, in, in the previous session that I, I believe that in a certain measure we will follow that, uh, go forward with the, the discussion. Uh, we heard that is a common sense that countries, different countries must uh, adopt legal uh, frameworks for data protection. But uh, as we heard before and we'll hear again certainly, uh, we have different levels of implementation and one point I would like uh, I would like to ask to all the, the, the panelists is to bring their point of view, uh, how they see the problem in general, and bring the experience of their countries and regions, but with a very pragmatic uh, uh, approach. That means we would appreciate to listen from you uh, what you as uh, watching uh, as positive in implementation and I would put a general question. If there is a, 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 a real awareness of, the, uh, of citizens and companies about all these issues, well, I, 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 I don't want to steal the time from everyone, and I give you back the word. Thank you. So one of the things um, we'll also be taking note of is the difference of how you manage what we consider pri you know, privacy versus data protection, because some people consider it the same thing, and then um, we see a delineation of that in the United States, so I'm always fascinated to see how other countries manage that. So our first, our opening question is actually to all the NRIs who are, are in the room. Uh, we want to talk about what the practices, privacy practices and data protection are working or are you reviewing at the uh, national or regional level? So. Who would like to be our, our opening discussion person? Go ahead. Can please introduce yourself? Okay. Good morning. My name is Abdia Zambrano from Panama uh, IGF. Uh, currently working in an NG, a Panamanian NGO based in Panama City, but working for all the Central American regions. So we are bringing a, a brief information about all the region. Um, answering your question, in Panama, good practices in personal data protection and privacy are practically non-existent. Uh, recently, uh, we launched a study called Who Has Your Back in its first edition in Panama. For example, in the field of telecommunications and telephone companies, few companies publish a personal data protection policy so that their clients know their rights. So it can be, it, be, it, it is a narrow uh, view for all citizens the same goes for transparency reports. It is something completely new in Panama, uh, and only on one company practices it. On the other hand, none of the companies notify users when they receive requests from the authority to access their user's data. Uh, another good practice that companies have is uh, the use of the HTTPS uh, protocol, uh, digital security protocol, to avoid information breaches through attacks or even robberies. Some of also some of the um, of the companies in Panama also use guidelines uh, for requesting personal information oriented to the authorities. Something new, 
and perhaps uh, what I just mentioned in your in your countries in, in your countries is a general rule, re, general rule. However, in Panama, it is not. Uh, the vast majority uh, of companies that apply these practices are foreign capital. So, uh, Panamanian companies uh, really uh, need to join these practices. Um, maybe. Uh, join all uh, the good practices that foreign companies have. Uh, if, um, well, if someone wants to know more about the result of this research, uh, please tell me later. So, did you, you said, did you all come up with something called "Who Has Your Back"? Is yeah. That, okay. And is that uh, something that you did from your I, your IGF perspective? Yeah. And is that available online, or how did you distribute it? Yeah, uh, I have some co uh, physical uh, copies, but I, we have online. If you have a link, too. you could share. Yeah. That'd be great. It'd be great to see that. Great. Who'd like to go next? Anyone? I guess I will go next. Um, and also, can we ask if the representative from France is here or not? Do we have a representative from France in the room? Okay. You okay. Know, it's, it's a big building. Maybe they'll be here in a bit. Okay. I just wanted to see if Acknowledge that Acknowledge them, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Does anybody feel like being from France this morning? <laughs> okay. Just checking. Well. I yeah. wouldn't mind being from France. I mean. <laughs> well, I'm happy to, to jump in. My name is Dustin Loop, and I will be representing what we discussed at the IGF USA and the kind of state of privacy and data protection uh, for us. So... Our situation is that right now we do not have a comprehensive federal privacy or data protection law, um, but instead have a variety of sex sector specific laws that cover things like healthcare or financial data, specific protections for children, and other things like that. And in addition to these federal laws that cover different sectors, we have a growing, vibrant patchwork of state laws. Uh, one a good example of that is that all 50 states plus the District of Columbia and several territories all have their own data breach notification laws. Um, and while, you know, generally they're, they have the same goal in mind, that doesn't always mean that they're completely compatible and it can create confusion for companies to comply even when they intend to. Um, so there may be discrepancies around what constitutes a breach, what kind of data breach and the type of information involved requires you to disclose that there was the breach and how quickly do you have to report that and who do you report it to? In some cases it's the state's attorneys general. In some cases, it's a different branch of government. Um, so this is just an, an example of one of the ways in which these, while there are, is a patchwork, it leaves potential gaps as well as overlaps that can be difficult for compliance. And kind of speaking of compliance issues, we now live in a world with uh, GDPR, which a lot of US companies have to be aware of as well, based on serving customers in Europe. And additionally, we have our own domestically grown state laws, uh, the most notable one of which is coming out of California. And it goes into effect this coming January, although because they're still figuring out what's actually in this bill, it won't actually be enforced until later in 2020. But um, this combination of all of these different pressures has pushed the sentiment in the U.S. to a point where we kind of at least agree that we want to have a federal baseline privacy law, which is a kind of big step in terms of our current divisive political scenario. Um, so I think that is a, a positive step for us to move forward and eventually get to some sort of federal law. Um, but until we get there, there have been some steps of current regulatory agencies actually kind of entrenching and really um, moving forward with strong enforcement. It was actually the day before we all gathered at the IGF USA to discuss this topic that 
our Federal Trade Commission announced its biggest ever fine of $5 billion against a major tech company. Most of you probably know who that is. Um, and they also included different requirements for restructuring within the corporation and hopes of kind of building a culture of compliance to things that relate to privacy and data protection. Um, so, so right now we kind of have a little bit more of a harms-based approach than a rights-based approach that you'll see uh, in places like Europe. And it, it would yet to be seen how that will be incorporated into a federal baseline privacy law. Um, but we are at least at a point where we can agree that the majority of people want one, and that's a good basis to hopefully get there sometime in the near future. Great. Other NRIs, Gibson, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Jimson Ulufuye. I'm from uh, the, you can say, Nigerian IGF and uh, uh, West African IGF, African IGF. I'm highly involved in all this. Um, I will just talk about uh, progress in Nigeria. Jimson, can you pull your microphone just a little closer? You're a little difficult to hear. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Is it better? Yes. Yes, I, I would like to talk about progress in Nigeria and uh, Kenya with regard to data protection. And uh, of course, talking about data protection, we're also talking about uh, privacy of data uh, and what have you. Well, in April this year, uh, the National Development, uh, National IT Development Agency of Nigeria that has the mandate to come up with standard and regulations framework uh, guiding ICT industry in Nigeria came up with uh, uh, a framework, a regulatory framework for data protection. And uh, that is the very first time we have something uh, to secure uh, data of uh, private citizens. And that is quite cross-cutting. And uh, it made provision uh, for uh, who to be responsible, uh, make delineation between the data controller, uh, data owner, and the, uh, the subject, data subject. And uh, for uh, violations, uh, for anyone processing about 10,000 uh, data subjects, uh, they have a penalty of about 2% of their gross income or a uh, financial fine of about 10 million naira, which is um, the around about, um, say, what is that now? It'd be 30,000 naira, $30,000. And if it is data subject less than uh, 10,000 subjects, then we'll be looking at a 1% uh, penalty for violation or maybe two uh, million uh, naira. So around about um, be $6,000 penalty. Uh, well, just a, it, sorry, just a follow up question on that. D have you actually had penalties on anyone or is this just a new guideline? Yeah, it's a new guideline and uh, it's kind of um, creating a lot of activities in the industry, uh, creating serious awareness. Uh, at this point, the contribution of ICT to GDP is about 13.8%. Uh, so, uh, and it's a serious issue that a lot of breaches and uh, nonchalant uh, handling uh, of citizen data. So, but this time around, there are a lot of jobs coming around that uh, new development. Uh, we, we have uh, data compliance agents appointed to help companies to become compliant. And uh, so there is a serious issue or serious discussion about the need to safeguard citizen data. So security comes into play and uh, also uh, concern uh, about breaches and what have you. In Kenya, uh, Kenya uh, came up with uh, the act, the Data uh, Protection Act, I think uh, as recent as two weeks ago or thereabout. And um, it, it's make provision for the 
uh, appointment or the setting up of a commission uh, with a commissioner to be in charge to oversee the implementation of the act. And um, of course, the same provision in terms of uh, uh, the data controller, the subject, uh, uh, the data subject, and uh, penalty for breaches. Uh, in Kenya, that's provision for jail term of five years. Nigeria doesn't have that. Uh, and also fine of up to, I think, five million shillings. Uh, but the issue now, uh, with, from what I gather, is that there's some form of litigation uh, on that act because uh, citizen feel is not uh, independent enough mm -hmm. because it's still within the civil service framework and there may be, there's concern that it could be compromised. So uh, the, the request or the, the desire is that it should be independent you know, the commission should be an independent commission. So that is the issue right now. Maybe uh, anyone from Kenya, uh, uh, IGF may talk more about that. But that is so far the activity going on. But in Nigeria, it's quite positive. It's creating a job and it's really reflecting that uh, policymakers are really becoming citizen focused and citizen centric. Thank you. So another question because I didn't catch it. On Nigeria, which ministry is it that is he heading up your privacy Okay, uh, as part of reform, uh, the Ministry of uh, Communication, okay. uh, uh, yeah, Ministry of Communication has been rebranded. Ministry of Communication and uh, Digital Economy is uh, the main ministry, but there is an agency responsible that is National Information Technology Development Agency. And uh, yeah, I just heard a voice. The, the chairperson or the convener of the Nigeria IGF is around, so uh, Mary Uduma, and who is also the chair of the African uh, I, MAG, IGF MAG. So, uh, Mary. Welcome, Mary. Other NRIs want to talk about if they did, did uh, privacy as an issue this year in health? I think there oh, is great. Thiago Tamaris from Brazil. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to provide you an update on the con Brazilian context uh, regarding data protection. Brazil uh, has passed our general data protection law in 2008. And after a long process of discussion Eight. that was started in 2009, when uh, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, the CGIBR, uh, 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 concluded uh, the, the decalogue of principles uh, for the internet governance in Brazil. And uh, the things evolved uh, out after the civil rights uh, framework came into force in 2014. Our new data uh, protection law has been very much inspired uh, in the GDPR in Europe. However, with some concerning innovations that could undermine the trust uh, on the enforcement uh, body uh, provision it to oversee the application of the law. Nowadays, we are in a situation of high uncertainty without the data protection authority effectively in place. Uh, and the situation becomes worse if we consider the teeny, uh, the, the teeny time frame to the new data protection law entering into force in August 2020. On the other hand, uh, our Supreme Court are discussing the legal aspects of encryption. And the CGIBR believes that the use of strong encryption is essential for secure and reliable, reliable information flows on the internet, not only for individual users, but also for business and public entities. In a public statement launched uh, last week, so before the IGF, uh, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee reaffirms uh, the importance of ensuring the free and appropriate uh, implementation of strong end-to-end -end encryption, both for the protection of data and communications confidentiality, and for the exercise of rights under the federal constitution and in constitutional laws, including the new uh, data uh, protection law. And, and also reaffirms that uh, an eventual implementation of privileged privilege, privilege, privilege access mechanisms through tools such as backdoors or master switches may be ineffective 
in face of technical aspects impossible to overcome in order to obtain the original message, besides potentially pro posing greater risks uh, while creating uh, security breaches that could be exploited for malicious uh, proposals. CGI also reaffirms that solid uh, encryption mechanisms are fundamental uh, to the integrity and security of digital systems, to business secrecy, as well as to ensure the non-liability of network intermediaries and the functionality, security, and stability of the Internet. And finally, CGI also highlights that a hypothetical choice for vulnerable encryption mechanisms would go against international best practices and severely affect the security of users and business on the Internet, as well as could inhibit innovation and emergence of business models. Uh, this uh, public statement was launched last week, as I said. It's available on our website. And, uh, and that discussion going uh, side by side with the discussion on how to better, better uh, structure our new uh, data protection authority, which is still unclear. So that was just last week? Sorry? It was just last week? Last week. We look forward to hearing how it goes next year. <laughs> so keep notes. Yeah. Wow, you guys have been busy. Other NRIs want to talk about privacy in their forum? Sebastian. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sebastian Bachelet, uh, IGF France, and um, I am here with which at, uh, as a board member of uh, AFNIC and uh, uh, President d'honneur of uh, Internet Society French chapter. Um, in France, privacy and data protection are key rights protected by an act in uh, of 1978 on information technology, data files, and civil liberties, and completed by European legislation, in particular regulation, uh, the GDPR and other directive and uh, convention from the Council of Europe. The French uh, privacy watchdog, NIL, has a general mission of informing individuals of their rights accorded to them by French Data Protection Act, protecting the right of citizens, regulating, inspecting, and also sanctioning. On January 21 this year, the CNIL has taken action under the GDPR um, and French law and issued Google a fine of 55 million euro based on complaints by uh, NOYB, none of your business, and um, <coughs> Sorry. And digital right activist La Quadrature du Net in May 2018. One of the key points of the decision is the lack of transparency and valid consent for ads personalizations. The GP GDPR has introduced new collective redress mechanism in the field of data protection. In France, it is possible to sue for compensation. Such collective action are ongoing in France. One of the key challenges is to qualify harm related to the violation of data protection rights. Does the violation of a procedural obligation by a data controller constitute reparable damage? How to qualify harm when it's come to asking for compensation? What's happened in cross-border situations where collective redress action meets a one-stop shop mechanism? I think it's a, um, what I can uh, give it to you as a IGF uh, in France uh, on, the, on this topic to give you a landscape of the situation of data privacy. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Great. We're going to move on to our next question. Well, uh, I'd like to make a more pragmatical and very objective uh, question for all the uh, panelists. Um, in terms of reinforcement of capacity to play this right, to execute the rules that we have been discussing. Uh, how, what can uh, citizens and users uh, really do 
And what role should internet platforms play in defining the standards for privacy and data protection online? Who can start? Yeah, can I? Go ahead, Gibson. Yeah. Kick us off here. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, again, my name is Jimson Olufuye, and um, I'm a member of the IGF SA, so um, my, that is Internet Governance Support Association. So, highly interested in a number of these uh, uh, questions, indeed. Uh, how can uh, users and platform also add values, you know, to this? We're talking about self-governance. Okay, uh, in the data protection regulation I mentioned, uh, there is a requirement that uh, uh, for every platform, uh, for every government uh, virtual presence, there has to be a privacy policy. Okay, uh, policy, policy uh, terms and conditions of uh, use, that's very important, so it's a requirement. Uh, before now, it wasn't so, uh, in fact, you find out about 99% of uh, platforms they don't have, uh, in Nigeria, for example, they don't have, uh, uh, say, a privacy policy or terms and conditions, but now it's as a requirement, standard. And the uh, agency responsible provided a kind of a guideline. So there has been a good res uh, responses to that. Uh, government is leading the way because usually, if uh, government does not lead, nothing really happens. So, with government leading the way with regard to their own presence, having the uh, privacy uh, uh, policy and terms and conditions, uh, that has kind of created good awareness for citizens too to take note. So, but as you know, it's quite challenging for users to read. Uh, times, you know, you buy a new device and you see a lot of uh, directions there. Many times you don't read it, but uh, it is recommended. At least, firstly, you should read, uh, be engaged. Uh, Organizations like ours, because I'm also a member of the Africa ICT Alliance, we also uh, do some sort of uh, housekeeping to ensuring best practices. Uh, for a number of us that are into platform development, yes, it is basic that we must have this uh, for every of our deliverables. Uh, we, we, we must uh, make sure that we, we put necessary framework in place to ensure that there is compliance uh, to uh, regulation. Uh, the agencies to need to do a lot of mobilization, awareness. Many people do not know about their rights. They don't know what to do. Uh, the NRI, the, the Nigerian IGF has really done a lot, and uh, perhaps Mary, uh, Mary will talk more about it. There is a lot of uh, uh, publicity uh, around multi-stakeholder engagement so that you can know your rights. You can also watch out for... Uh, at least for your for the way your data is handled, okay. So, uh, but awareness is key, as you know. The weakest part of uh, any form of cyber security uh, process is the human part of it. So, we need to do more about capacity development, uh, even as we are focusing on sustainable development goal. Uh, today, six trillion dollars is the loss uh, measurement for breaches, abuse, and what have you. So, uh, uh, so citizens need to take it seriously. Uh, banks as well, uh, they, they lose a lot of uh, money, so they need to take it off seriously. And we need to guide our assets. And if it's important, then we should be concerned about it. We should pay more attention. So let's talk more about it. Let there be more uh, uh, IGF at the local level. With that, there will be more awareness and uh, more citizens will take uh, their uh, the, the, the data seriously. So I, I think uh, the, the long and short of it is that uh, government needs to continue to lead the way and uh, provide support for the efforts of NGOs like us uh, and NGOs 
that at the local, regional, and the national and global level. Thank you. Uh, in that regard, I would like to propose uh, a discussion that could be uh, uh, structured in two uh, bullet points. Uh, the first one uh, regarding um, the need for a minimum accountability and transparency with standards that should be adopted by by all the platforms. And in that regard, we should take in account that there's an asymmetric uh, sizes. There's a lot of asymmetries on size uh, power policies uh, when we look for the, the, the all the, the, the platforms and, and and, uh, and how uh, the internet is structured nowadays. And another uh, topic, another uh, thing that we should look for is uh, the capacity, how to, to enhance or foster the capacity building uh, to enhance users' uh, digital skills and literacy on privacy and data uh, protection. I believe that these two uh, goals perhaps could uh, benefit uh, the debate on the next years. Hi, good morning. I'm uh, Roberto Zambrana. I'm the coordinator of our IGF in Bolivia. And we will also ha would like to have a, to give our perspective about it in this pragmatic way that you were asking before. I think um, Many years ago, the people weren't that scared about protecting their data. I remember those days when the people got into a national office or perhaps an event and they were asked to provide the personal information, I, they wouldn't matter about it. But after the GDPR stuff and all the discussions about this matter, more people started to be aware. But even, even, even these days, uh, these same people actually uh, uh, whether they are conscious or not, are given their not only personal information but also private information uh, through through social media, for instance. And uh, I, I I will say that this is this is uh, a problem of how we are really really conscious of what we are accepting uh, when we we sign for these terms of use of these platforms. Uh, as you know, there are tens and tens of pages that you have to see, and you usually don't, because you need to use any platform or any of this uh, social media stuff, like uh, Google Maps. I mean, I don't know if, uh, I'm sure many of you have the same experience that, uh, that I had. And the first time it was really scary. I mean, I was going out of a supermarket, and then a message pops up in my, in my telephone it says, so how was your experience in the supermarket? You see, so how, the, first, the first question was, how the platform knows that I was in the supermarket? The, the, so the platform knows that I'm anytime in anywhere? Who authorized it? the platform actually to have this information? And uh, when these questions are asked, uh, then you remember that yes, I remember that someday because I wanted to use Google Maps, I had to accept something. I don't know what, because I, I didn't read like uh, 100 pages. So I think uh, it, indeed it's important this capacity awareness, the capacity building. Indeed it's important to have this awareness. It's important to provide this kind of education, particularly to our, to our vulnerable uh, members of our communities, children for instance because they give away pictures, they give away activities through social media, and uh, you know that in the wrong hands it could be really harmful, really dangerous for them. Uh, but um, the other thing we need to do is try to, try to join forces in order for the big companies to start synthesizing, to start providing very specific terms in their terms of use, um, that we all really know of what we are seeing what, when we are accepting this. Uh, Sebastian, you, you have asked the word, but I, I have a question and ask you to complete your answer. 
you make reference you made reference to the French national law uh, that you have since the year 1978 and all of us know that you have a very traditional and important uh, agency the like NIO. and we would like to know uh, from your experience that uh, how important it is to have a, a good and active a national agency for data protection. And if you believe that uh, CNIL does uh, the correct job. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sebastian Bachelet, once again. I, uh, uh, to answer your question, I hope that nobody from the CNIL is in the room because um, or will listen to me. Um, uh, but I, I, I think it's, a, first, it's a very good tool to have an independent uh, structure taking care of uh, uh, this matter. The fact that it uh, came very early in France uh, was a good asset for uh, including a user. Uh, but I, I can say at the same time that uh, the fact that they are both um, having the, to advise, to uh, take action, and eventually to be the legal part, because they can uh, send fine to uh, an organization, it's maybe a little bit too much broad, and um, the separation of power here seems to me personally not uh, to be completely achieved here. But, but it's good to have them, and uh, they help on uh, some of the topics. At the same time, I think it's important that we, um, as a user or, uh, and when I talk about user here, I'm not talking just about individual user as I am representing, but also business user must to have a, a real voice in this uh, type of organization. Then it's, it's came to this discussion about regulation and uh, uh, the action of the multi-actors, multi-stakeholder uh, activities. And uh, it's where I think uh, those structures need to evolve to be to embrace more the multi-stakeholder uh, way of of doing things than they are doing today. Um, because, for example, the discussion about GDPR in Europe, where uh, CNIL where was a leading force, um, give a long discussion within ICANN on the same type of topic for. Uh, RDS, uh, Registry Data Services, what used to be called WIS. Um, and and uh, I would have been happy if they have uh, opened this discussion at the national level also to allow better preparation of what is happening at the European level and now at the uh, worldwide level. Um, I, I don't want to jeopardize the, the uh, time here, but ISOC France is doing two things uh, to answer your first question. Uh, the first one is to, uh, as it was said before, the uh, term and condition are not read by a lot of people. Um, and uh, ISOC, uh, Internet Society France work on trying to have a less complex and shorter uh, version of those term of condition to allow people to read the more important part of those documents and uh, to be in bold character and not it's too small not to be readable and so on and so forth. That's one action. The second action is what we call e -T, and e -T, it's the goal is to take GDPR at their word and to see what is happening in big platform and um, this action today it's uh, a lawsuit to, against uh, um, uh, one of the platform, uh, and, and uh, we will see what what will happen on that. I will stop here, but if you can give me back the uh, speech later on to allow others to talk um, as we bring some uh, key message from uh, the IGF Paris, not the IGF in Paris, the global one, but the national one. Uh, I have five uh, messages who could be interesting for the group. Thank you. Great. So our last uh, question, then we can just open it up for general questions to the group, is um, are nationalities developed or nationally developed standards 
globally acceptable? Because I think we have two sides of this equation. As consumers, we want to know when we're using a global platform, what information we're giving up and how it's being used. And then how is that working from the other side, which is compliance for these companies and your ministries that are working more on the data side? And how do we make sure that the information that they're keeping is, we, it, it, it's trans, it's a, it, we have accountability to what they're collecting and there's also transparency for the uh, individual user. So anyone want to comment on how that's going? Thoughts? Jimson, yes. Thank you very much. This is uh, Jimson Lulufi. Well, perhaps before I go into this, uh, maybe if you allow me, uh, to, because we talk about uh, user awareness, okay? There are basic things that we users can do to ensure that uh, uh, presence, online presence is protected. Uh, for example, with a smartphone like this, you can actually uh, disable your location, okay? Just right here, you can disable your location. And if you disable your location, uh, it will not work. They cannot see where you are, basically. So there are some basic things you can do. You, users, they need to be aware of that, okay? Now, um, talking about a standard, uh, whether the national framework aligns with global standard. The issue is, what's the global standard? Do, do we have an acceptable global standard? What is the reference? But so far, uh, from what we could glean, uh, that of uh, GDPR has been globally uh, considered, and uh, at least global companies are making reference to it, and they're trying to comply. And also, uh, national uh, authorities to uh, using it as a reference point as well. So I can say from what we've seen, uh, the Nigerian Data Protection uh, Regulation uh, I got some endorsement from uh, maybe EU data authorities and as there is some level of handshaking uh, going on right there. And of course, we do have the uh, African Union Data Protection uh, uh, Regulation as well, or advisory. And so that is also a, a, a reference. Uh, but the basic thing is, as I said earlier, uh, the, the consideration for uh, natural person and legal person uh, for their data to be protected and they are also, uh, the, what is expected of them is quite the same in a way, but is the issue of a penalty now that differ. Uh, I think while GDPR is talking about 5% of, uh, let's say, net, the Nigeria is talking about 2% of gross, okay, or 10,000 data subjects. Why can't I is talking about uh, imprisonment, okay, uh, possibility of imprisonment, and then also a fine about 5 million shillings. So those are the only uh, different issues, and it, sh it reflects on the issue of uh, sovereignty and jurisdiction, uh, but I think it would be good for there to be opportunities to, for this review towards maybe a one framework. Because as, as it stands, as it stands, we can't say this is the uh, global uh, framework, no. But it would be good for there to be some form of um, uh, synchronization uh, in this regard so that uh, broader, uh, data can move on, on cross-border basis. Okay, so that uh, data can, your data can be in Malaysia and uh, you have confidence that the Malaysia data protection provision takes care of your data. So I think that's where the challenge is now. Uh, for businesses uh, that host maybe data offshore, okay, where, you be, where it's being hosted, does it have good data protection or privacy framework? So. Uh, so it's in the business interest, it's in our interest that this is resolved because uh, it will help business. It will uh, ensure that even startups can easily uh, really scale up because you can then host your data somewhere where uh, the electricity is stable, where you, 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 you have good uh, skill sets to protect your data. So. 
uh, with such environment, you can easily deploy and scale up your business. So it help businesses. If we can put this together, if there could be uh, acceptable framework, and uh, I think uh, our regional organization would do well to work on this. EU has already done something. Uh, AU has done something. So maybe in Asia and uh, North America, Latin America, something could happen. And uh, then we're on the way to creating more opportunities uh, for businesses around the world. And when we do that, prosperity will come to the people. And then we will be addressing the sustainable development goals. Because the more job we create, the better for the society and for our expectation. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? May I? Oh. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adriele. I'm from Brazil. I'm a lawyer. And just like my previous colleague just said, and the preparacy must come to people, right? And I believe that the platforms, they will provide this uh, perfectly. And for this development, uh, I'm quite sure that the framework between pink, the countries should be observed. So whenever we talk about data preservation, data protection, and transnational flow of data, then we should think about a due process of law. So you know, uh, if it's, it's not worth it to say that we have good frameworks and we have regulations, but if they're not observed inside their own countries. And we also should think about how they, inter they interconnect between each other. So this is something that we would think about, make simple laws that they could be easily observed by all the countries. And going back to the, the last previ your previous question about how the citizens may contribute and may have some digital literacy, just like Tiago Tavares said. And Brazil now has a project to amend its constitution to include data protection, personal data protection, as a fundamental right. So this is something that will bring a light to all the citizens. So once data protection is inside the constitution, it's become, it becomes the core of the fundamental right, then sure that the citizens will be more empowered to say, hey, I have to protect my rights, my personal data. So we believe that with this project of amendment of a constitution, it's going to be very useful for that. Thank you. OK. I would like to invite you, Lidiana, to say a word, because I heard uh, Lidiana's speech from, uh, she will introduce herself, she's from North Macedonia, but she brought a very interesting point of view because she explained, and she will do it, that her, her country doesn't have a specific uh, data protection law, but they have to comply with the GDPR in, in a, a pragmatic way. I, I, I would like you to say a word about this. Um, and I would uh, actually press the button, but thank you for the invites. Um, yes, I come from North Macedonia. It's a country from the Western Balkan region. We are not an EU country member, but we are signatory party to the Convention 108 from Council of Europe because we are a member of Council of Europe. So we are implementing data protection law um, act that is uh, harmonized with um, Directive 9546. But as not part of the EU, we have not harmonized and not implemented GDPR as well. But what we have is actually a constitutional right of uh, data protection provision within the Constitution and a specific provision within the Constitution as a privacy of fundamental human right. But we don't have a specific privacy law. It's an all, only a data protection law where we um, in the comments of the law, we see the privacy um, as a result of processing the personal data. So, um, but what we see as a necessity, as I was speaking in the, in the previous panel, although as a country or as a region we are not EU uh, members and not GDPR, let's say, compliant, um, we do find a way how to actually implement the technical requirements on different um, levels, either on IT or platform level or procedural processor processes level, in order to implement standards that are requirements from the GDPR as well. 
Why? Because there is a strong need from, and as we have seen from the cross-border cooperation, um, just to explain in, in a very a practical way, there, are, there is a dental tourism that is developed in the past couple of more than five years, let's say, and this dental tourism brings EU um, nationals from our neighbor, neighboring countries, which is Greece and Bulgaria, into my country, uh, because dental, uh, why dental tourism? Dental uh, dentist uh, services are cheaper in my country than in the EU country. So what happened in the yes in the very um, the, the the towns which are near to the border became dental clinics. Yeah. Yes, uh, but um, that enforced one patient from Greece uh, to ask for medical record from um, the dentist he was going uh, into it because he wanted to make aware uh, uh, to his dental office in his town in Greece which is a GDPR right, right, the data subject right, to be able to get your data, or your personal data, and transfer also the data into another country. But what happened? Um, the dental clinic was not aware of you know, this data subject right, so didn't know what actually they need to do and how to do it in order to give them or not this, this medical file. So that became an issue, and then they requested for some help. But again, we saw that this is an, um, a, a challenge and an issue because we do not have in place the, the GDPR as a regulation. But again, in the technical, uh, what we did in the technical requirements, my organization uh, developed some GDPR tools, as we say, because it's, it's a GDPR, mm -hmm. right? So it's a kind of diagnose when you don't know from what, which provision from GDPR you are ill then you can, uh, by some using some technical tools, you can have a diagnose, a diagnose what to do in these terms. So um, countries that do not have legal frameworks um, are very important in, in this, finding the most suitable um, policy level, uh, how to react and to prevent even uh, data protection um, and privacy as well. But again, uh, we, we think that there is a possibility that the technical departments and IT uh, uh, specific, uh, let's say, uh, IT experts can really help us into introducing some um, tools that could really uh, be requirements implementing and enforcement of already uh, existing uh, legal frameworks as it is GDPR. So by the time we adopt it in the parliament or by the time we became an EU uh, member country, we can uh, technically, on a technical level, technical experts can help us in uh, implement and enforce this kind of um, standards. Thank you. Great. Um, Sebastian, did you have something else you wanted to bring up from your IGF? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I think part, part of the message from the IGF uh, France, uh, in France was um, could, could answer uh, your, your question also. I, I will read our five um, main uh, topic. Uh, the, the, it was under the umbrella of platform governance or regulation behind recommendation and algorit algorithmic filters. The first one is develop proposal for systemic regulation of essential platforms. The second one is study the establishment of an authority on platform regulation. I guess that it's more at the uh, French level, and when we say establishment, it could be given to a current authority, but um, it was to have this uh, in mind in the discussion with the authority and with the government. The third one is work on strong coordination among the organization involved in internet governance, and it's part what you are doing here, and it's important that we follow up on that job. For it studies the role of internet users, implementation of short time dispute resolution procedures, in addition to the longer term intervention of the judge in the platform and algorithm regulation fields. And the last one, it's target regulation or governance of processes, information gathering, moderation, and publication, rather than regulation on data. Um, that's the five points we uh, bring from the discussion we had in, in, in France. And I want to add that um, um, we, we, um, 
um, in, in the field of, uh, of ICANN, who is not directly related with that, but as we are working with structure who are representing end user, it's a place where we can bring information and uh, uh, at the global level, at the regional level, and of course at the national level, who could be a, a useful tool to be uh, taking into account in distributing the information about this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead, yes. Could you identify yourself? Yeah, you. Um, so I will be quite brief. Uh, so um, I just wanted to add that regarding the discussion on global standards for data protection, uh, I think something that uh, could be useful in the discussion is uh, to talk, well, there is a convention that is starting to become a de facto global convention for data protection, which is Convention 108 and its modernized version, uh, but this is more of a de facto convention, um, international convention. Um, but there is an also another document, which is the uh, 2009 Madrid Declaration of the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners, um, which is interesting because it reflects maybe a more global perspective because it was not only elaborated by member countries of the Council of Europe, but by all the authorities that are taking part in uh, what is now called the Global Privacy Assembly because the ICDPPC just changed its name this year. Um, and um, so this is the one thing. And the other thing, yes, uh, from both this discussion here and from the previous discussion uh, just before this morning on data protection, um, it does seem that the, what is really left to build is really confidence between the different countries and jurisdictions with regards to the protection of personal data and with the protection of privacy. And so um, in the future, we'll probably, I guess, hear more and more emphasis on the independence of data protection authorities. But also I would, and now unfortunately there's no more time to talk about this, but um, be curious to hear about uh, national initiatives um, of collective redress, actually, because collective redress is a mechanism that allows to complement the action by data protection authorities where civil society organizations um, um, or class actions can also play a role probably in, in all this um, discussion on enforcement. So yeah, probably there is no t more time for input from different countries on, on collective redress, but um, if you want to discuss this during the break, I will be uh, very happy to hear about news from elsewhere in the world. Thank you. That's a very good suggestion. Well, we are down to 23 seconds. <laughs> so I just want to thank everyone. I know you did a lot of work this year, and you probably have in the past on the, the, um, the NRI. So thank you very much for the continued work that you're doing. And as you said, these discussions can continue on in, in the hallway conversation. So um, we just want to appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you around the hall. <laughs>